This is a, a message that is, uh, let me just preface it by saying, give me a, a hall pass if I don't get this one pulled off right. Um, this is a difficult subject, but I want to start on the subject of worship. And I think the only way I can really start on the subject of worship is with this subject. And uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult. So don't brace in that it's a condemning word, but it's, a, it's an insightful word. We'll, we'll just call it that, okay? We are moving into a worship series, and a lot of people don't understand worship. A lot of people are uncomfortable with certain styles of worship. And a lot of times I look like I'm trying to cheerlead you. And uh, I can't help it if I'm happy. I, 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 I got sour in church at one point in my life, and now I'm not sour anymore. I'm happy because Jesus came to save me and to deliver me. So excuse me for having a really good time. And, and you know, I had one guy tell me, I've, I've had every criticism. Have you? I mean, there's always critics, right? Man, you look like you're just trying to entertain people. I said, no, I'm trying to entertain the Lord. Y'all are just watching me do that. I'm having a good time in the presence of God. I, you know... I get to play with wonderful musicians who equally love the Lord, and we love to worship the Lord. And we're not here to play for the audience. We're here to play for the Lord. And it should be the best we have, and it should be joyful. And even if we mess up, it should be forgiven, right? So, right? But a lot of people have a hard time with worship, especially if you came from a, a background of, of no church whatsoever. And your idea of church is a more solemn assembly, and there are times that happens. Uh, if you come for, from a more high church background, Episcopal Catholic, you're used to a higher, more solemn, uh, lots of pockets of quiet. You're used to that. Uh, if you come from a spirit-filled Pentecostal background, uh, you're probably used to a little crazier than what we get into. Um, but uh, we all seem to stumble over this worship thing. Uh, it, it, it literally is the number one call I get from pastors because I have been a worship leader so many years. They'll go, look, I got trouble in my worship. <laughs> and I'm like, well, surprise, surprise. God had trouble in his worship to start with, and it started with a, an angel called Lucifer. And uh, he, was, he was a real problem. Um, God did something with Lucifer that I think that was unprecedented and the scripture bears it out. It bears it out in very flowery words. A lot of the uh, pop, pop culture, we think Lucifer has horns and a pitchfork and, and a tail and, or he's dark and he's black and he's sinister or the grim reaper or, I mean, Lucifer gets painted in a lot of ways, but according to the scripture, he's not any of those. He's an angel of light and he's gorgeous and he's perfect in beauty and he's full of wisdom. He's everything opposite of what pop culture. See, if the, if the devil can make everybody think he's opposite to what he is, he wins because he can fool them. That's why as the time grows toward the coming of the Lord, there'll be great deception because the angel of light will come and deceive people with a lot of lies wrapped in a little truth. And they'll believe it because it's coming from this beautiful angel. It would never come from the devil because he's dark and has a pitchfork and a skull head and, and a, you know, right? He would never do that. Matter of fact, you'll notice in the scripture, I noticed in our passage last week in some scripture I've been reading about Samson and Delilah. I'm going to preach on that in a minute, but not today. Uh, I, I noticed where the angel of the Lord came and appeared. And every time the angel of the Lord appears, there's this human desire to worship the angel because it's so fantastic. And every angel that is true with the Lord, number one, will not give you his name, typically, except for Lucifer, who was an angel of the Lord. Gabriel and Michael, though the only three angels that are named in the Bible, the rest of them will not take a moment to glorify themselves long enough to give you their name. They will refer you straight to God. That's why Apostle Paul says, if an angel of light comes, don't receive him. If he's preaching to you anything other than what we've told you, don't receive him because he'll dazzle you. And the most dazzling lies are the ones that are wrapped in white and beauty. They look harmless, right? That's why as this church, please keep your Bible with you. If it's an electronic one, keep your Bible. Check me out. If I'm preaching what's not here, you're welcome to send me a letter and go, Pastor, that wasn't in the Bible. And I got a little confused about that. Don't trust anybody. Trust the Word. Trust the Word. Okay? Now, 
our, our most important task is probably to respond properly to the presence and the glory of God, but it doesn't seem natural to us as humans. It's just not a natural thing for most Christians. Many of us have to admit we're really not good at worship. We're clumsy at best. And we have baggage of worship. We have some of you who come from spirit-filled churches, you're used to a wild, crazy thing that's embarrassing to you, and you want to get as far away from that as you can. Those of you who come from various places, it's just, but there's a re I wonder why it's, why is it that we're not good at this? What, what is it about worship that is so difficult to get good at? And why is it that everybody sets up the little encampment around the worship they like to participate in? Why is it, pardon me, that the millennials have a style of worship that they respond to, but they don't respond to this? Why is it that everybody over 60 responds to hymns, but not to that? We camp around the style of worship music or the mode of worship, and we lift it up above the other modes, thinking that because it's the mode we like, it's the best. Is anybody here? Well, let me tell you why that is. See, some would say the reason we have these issues with worship is because of the fallen nature of man that we, and the carnality of the world we live in. There's so much darkness in the world. And, and, and you're right to somewhat, but the source of the problem isn't just the fallen condition or just the fallen state of existence. The real issue is the fallen archangel and his chief product that he promotes. Satan was once called Lucifer, which means the morning star, son of the dawn. I want to show you a scripture. Look, look at this in Ezekiel. This is talking about Lucifer. Now, this is frightening when you think about it because you're going, really? You were, note, note the connotation, were, not now, but you were. The anointed cherub who covers. I, who's I? God, I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. Now, what's the holy mountain of God? The Bible says, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Not just anybody can go up the mountain of the Lord. There has to be preparation for the journey, right? By the blood of the lamb, we call him Abba Father. We come into the presence of the Lord by the Holy Spirit through the blood of the lamb. Is anybody here? I'll preach really long if you're not here. But it, I can preach longer to empty seats, but if you're with me, it'll be really quick, okay? You were on the holy mountain of God. You walk back and forth of, uh, in the midst of the fire stones. Fire stones, interplanetary travel, inner, literally, you know, do you know, astronomers think that there's probably 500 million more universes, maybe even billion universes besides our own Milky Way. It's that vast, okay? How big is God, right? Lucifer, at some point in his creation, in his beginnings, had access to practically everywhere. Most angels have an assignment. The cherubim and the seraphim go before the throne of the Lord continually saying, holy, holy, holy. They have an assignment before the throne that they continually worship the Lord, right? Angels of the Lord ascend and descend. We preached on that a few weeks ago. You have angels assigned to you. Isn't that comforting? You really do. You have angels that are assigned to you to be with you in the car, in the house, everything, at your business. They're there. Yes, right? They're, but they have a jurisdiction. They give, they're given a jurisdiction. Lucifer was allowed to have Open travel. You walked up and down among the fiery stones. Everywhere you wanted to go. You were perfect. Oh, look at that. You were perfect. Man, how many of us are striving for perfection? He, he had it. Perfect. In your ways. From the day you were created. Till iniquity was found in you. Interesting. How do you find iniquity in perfection? The Bible says also in this same passage that he was the sum of wisdom. Literally means as full of wisdom as you can get. The Bible also says wisdom is one of the greatest things you can ask for. The sum of wisdom. He's full of wisdom. He's perfect in beauty. He's got every access to, he has perfect, complete access to anywhere he wants to be. But yet iniquity is found. How do you find iniquity in that? Well, the Bible goes on to say why, and we'll get to it in just a moment. See, Satan provides this living proof that the greatest worshiper can become the greatest idolater under the influence of pride and presumption. Pride and presumption. Here's what God said to him going down. Look at this. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. Literally, stay right there. Literally, 
Lucifer just has to be this most dazzling being. When you read the Bible, it's very descriptive of him. It talks about uh, topaz and onyx and sapphire that are embedded in his body. He's gorgeous. He's made to be a mirror. He's made to capture the light of the glory of the throne and cast it among the fiery stones. He's made to capture the countenance and the radiance of God Almighty and pass it through this body of his and just portray it in beautiful prisms all throughout the universes. That's what his purpose was. All the angels came around Lucifer and said, I've never seen anything like you. I've never seen anything like you. There's nobody like you. I've never, even God's own glory shines as one color. But when you capture it, you turn the beauty of God into something amazing. Imagine hearing that over and over and over and over and over. And he says, you became proud on account of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. God immediately reacts to Lucifer's pride. And he takes the son of the morning and he says, Lucifer, because you believed your own press release, you're out of here. And thank you, Lord, he cast him to the earth. Thank you. And he just happened to put his favorite people in the world on the earth. Thank you for that too, right? Consider the contrast between Satan, the highest worshiper who fell to the depths through pride, and then the worshiper David, who was a lowly shepherd, and he rose to the heights of prophetic and earthly destiny through worship, humility. David's rise, see, we still rise and fall over the same things today as born again believers, we really do. David's way of worship in the presence of God or we stumble down the path of Lucifer and we think of ourselves as superior in the way we do things. If you're a believer or a Sunday school teacher or a worship leader or a minister of the gospel, you can't afford to ignore Lucifer because Paul points to him a lot in the New Testament. And one place he points is 2 Corinthians. Somebody says, I don't wanna hear a sermon about Lucifer. Well, I don't either, but Paul preached about him, so hello. In 2 Corinthians, he says, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we're not unaware of his schemes. What are his schemes? He delights in seeing God's creation fall into the same trap that he fell into because misery loves company. And don't tell me it's not everywhere, really? I mean, are we seeing it in political things right now? It's like, aren't I wonderful? If the Democrats could just get a moment, we could fix this. If the Republicans could, we could fix this. Uh, anybody here? Yeah. It happens in churches. That'd be really good if I was up there. I've listened to preacher preach for a long time, but you know what? I can preach better than him. If he'd ever give me a shot, I'd show him how to do this. And maybe you're not that blatant with it, but we all deal with it. I mean, come on, I'm a musician. I've sat and listened to CDs before and went, why didn't they call me for that session? I could have played that. <laughs> Anybody here? How many of you are businessmen and you've seen people just make stupid money like Mark Zuckerberg? Yeah. And you're going, he should not be a billionaire. I mean, all he did was make people talk about themselves all the time. <laughs> and look at him, he's stupid, wealthy. That should have been me. You see how slick that path is that you can slide right to it? That's why I'm talking about it today. I'm not talking about it to bring you down. I'm not talking about it to make you feel bad. I'm talking about to uncover the ways of the enemy so that you go, oh, I can see what that is. I see what that is. See, because there's something that, that causes us to all, original sin is pride. Original sin was, was literally 
Eve walking over to the tree that she was told to stay away from and convinced by the serpent that maybe she could get more from that tree than what God had already given her. What is that? Pride. What would, be, what would it be like in the kingdom of God if we'd quit helping God out? And just let God be God and trust God and not go, now God, if you do this, I can help you out here and then we'll do something together. And God's going, I got this. Don't, don't really need anything, but just obey. Apostle Paul warned believers to forgive one another in order that Satan not outwit us. Forgive, forgive. Ultimately, many in the church are totally unaware of Satan's schemes and his efforts untiringly to destroy God's dream. God's dream is for you and God to be in perfect communion. And perhaps it's, it, it, it explains why we feel so outwitted by the enemy so many times. Because most of our church services and our, are kind of, pardon me, are kind of set up like a performing center. There's a stage and there's an audience. And there's nothing wrong with this as long as we remember that Satan's determination is to lure us into pride and presumption. As long as we're aware of that. See, because the same thing that makes us prone to elevate other people to a status of idols whenever we find something admirable in their leadership or personality. See, we can admire people as long as we don't worship them or put them above God. Let me just one more time for you as the pastor of this church. Don't put me up to a place that I can't stay. Don't put me at a high place that I can't live. Don't put me at a place that you don't think I'm a human being. You're gonna mess up if you do that because one day you're gonna see my humanity, you're gonna be disappointed. No, magnify only the Lord. Don't magnify his servant. Magnify Jesus, magnify his word. Remember, everything that's happened that's rotten in your life happened at the hands of somebody but not God. And never get entangled in the fact that, well, God's people did this to me. Oh, they may have done it to you innocently because we're all kind of silly at times, but promise you, God was not in you being torn down. But how do we get in trouble? We, we, we put our music teams and our choirs and our preachers up front for everyone to see, and then we wonder why people in leadership fall into pride and why people <laughs> in the spectator church fall into religious idolatry. I've known ministers who get drunk on the power. They get drunk on the admiration. They have the little parking place, the little manservants. I mean, they get all caught up in it like they're a rock star. I go to churches, well, I'm gonna say it, sorry, don't get mad at me. I go to churches all the time where Christian musicians go and they've gotta have certain things in their dressing room. Really? This is a church, it's not a performing arts center. This is a church. You be a star at the arena, but here we're all servants. You get it? All of us, the same, all of us. All of us. I mean, I'm glad when they actually give me a glass of water. I'm like, yeah. One guy told me one day at a conference, I was the third guy in that week, and he said, you're the easiest person I've ever dealt with with this sound. He, he said, the guy before you was a jerk. He treated us all awful. He was demanding. I said, what's his name? And he told me his name. And I went to the pastor. I said, why are you having idiots in here? <laughs> Find people who treat your people right. You know, I appreciate David on the sound. I appreciate the people doing the overheads. Let me tell you, I, I don't, I've been in churches where preachers talk down to them and yell at them and carry on. That ain't happening here. We're going to do that. We're all servants of the Lord here. All of us are servants of the Lord. Every one of us. We're going to treat everybody the best we can. Okay, the best we can. Now, if you act like a nut, we'll deal with you. In grace and mercy. You know, some people can't take a hint, right? You just kind of have to get direct. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Love you, but stop now. <laughs> the truth is that you can lead worship, preach the word, and minister before people 365 days in a row and stay clear of error by placing your focus on whom you're ministering to, God and God alone. There's never a reason to fall down that slope. See, I love the scripture that says, magnify the Lord. When we magnify anything but the Lord, we give, it, we give it dominance and preeminence over everything else in our vision. See, ultimately, sometimes we get a taste for glory, but it isn't our glory. God made us with, as, with an intellectual dimension and an emotional dimension. And we're capable of making decisions because 
on pure, we can make decisions purely on intellect and logic. But logic only offers accurate conclusions when there is accurate data and honest deliberation. And when they're all working together, we can make an accurate decision. We're capable of reasoning our way to any conclusion we desire, totally independent of logic. Trust me, I've done many counseling sessions. And I go, you have firmly drank the Kool-Aid. You ain't listening to anything, nobody. You're not listening to nothing, nothing anyone says. You're just not going to hear it. See, the Lord talks a great deal about pride in his word. This may not be true in your life, but I have learned. With every level of education, knowledge that I've achieved, I deal with a new level of pride. Does that mean I shouldn't study and learn and seek the greater knowledge in my life? Well, no. However, we should be, not be unaware of the devil's schemes. Anything capable of inflating pride in our hearts is, and minds is a signal for greater caution and deeper humility. And we get proud over the craziest things. We really do.